Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the June meeting of the New York State Zone Commission on Public Ethics. Before we get started, uh, I want to thank you all for joining me today. I hope all of you and your families continue to be healthy and safe as the health crisis continues. This meeting is being held using video conferencing technology. The public session is accessible on Jacob's website to watch via live stream. Thank you to everyone who assisted with enabling this meeting. For the time being, Jacob's physical offices continue to be closed, but we anticipate that the Albany office will open to the public in July to accept filings and other documents. Similarly, we expect that some of the Jacob operations that were paused for the past few months will resume shortly after the Albany office reopens. Announcements will be made and distributed at the appropriate time. We will continue to evaluate the circumstances of the health crisis to determine whether further accommodations are still needed. Please contact the commission staff if you need assistance. Although the majority of staff will continue to work from home, they continue to be available to provide ethics and lobbying guidance, aid with public disclosure filings, ethics training, and other mandated services. Finally, to conduct this meeting smoothly, I will be monitoring the video and will do my best to recognize anyone who wishes to speak. It is important that only one person speak at a time. In addition, I ask that when you speak, please identify yourselves so that we have a clear record. We will need to, as we did in our last public meeting, take votes by roll call to ensure that everyone is counted. Otherwise, please mute your phone when you are not planning to speak. All right, let's move on. Um, approval of the minutes behind attachment A. Any questions or comments? I can't see, so uh, just for clarity here, Walt, I, I can only see a very few people on my screen. So if someone is raising a hand, you know, I can't see it, so you'll have to let me know. Okay, I haven't seen anybody. Does anybody have a, a question or comment? Okay, hearing none, can I have a motion to approve? Commissioner Weissman. Thank you, Commissioner. Second. Commissioner Yates. Okay, who's taking the role? Is it Marvin, I mean Martin? Martin, are you taking the role? We can't hear you if you're speaking. Is Albany muted? Go ahead, Martin. Martin. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Deering on the minutes. Yes. Approved. Commissioner DePiro. Commissioner DePiro. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, no, yeah. we can. Commissioner Fisher. Yes. Commissioner Horowitz. Yes. Commissioner Jacob. Yes. Commissioner Levine. Yes. Commissioner Weissman. Yes. Commissioner Yates. Sorry, Judge, Judge Yates. Okay, great. And Chair Rosen. Yes. To be clear, I, I saw Judge Yates' vote on the screen. Am I off mute now? Yes. Yeah, I'm no, you Thank you. Okay, uh, item three on the agenda, report from staff. Great. Um, so we just wanted to report to the commission with respect to the candidates FBS filings who are running in the primary today. Um, there were seven, 317 candidates running for open seats in the primary for state legislative office. We have been working with the Legislative Ethics Commission on compliance with the FBS filing requirements. On May 11th, we sent out 172 confidential fail to file notices, which provide 15 days for the candidate to file. On May 29th, we sent notices of delinquency to 72 candidates that still had not filed. That list of delinquent candidates was posted on Jacob's website as required by law. 
to date, there are 43 still outstanding. Does anyone have any questions? I do. Move on. Does Sorry. Sorry for my ignorance, but if they win the primary, how does this impact them uh, if they fail to file? We will pursue compliance and enforcement if necessary. Okay, thank you. Um, with respect to the annual report, as we reported the last meeting, we've been working to finalize the, the um, a draft of the report. We expect to have that draft to the commissioners next week. And after the commissioners have an opportunity to review it, then we would expect to publish it in early July. Any questions about the annual report? Okay. Um, okay, let's move to, to, to item Martin. four, attachment B, proposed uh, lobbying reg regulations. I'll, uh, I'll start off, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a reminder, what you have before you is a set of proposed revisions to the Commission's comprehensive lobbying regulations, as well as the source of funding regulations, and those are at parts 943 and 938, respectively, of Title 19. Uh, the original lobbying regulations were promulgated over a very lengthy process running from 2016 to 2018 and went into effect January 1st of 2019. Uh, these were the first set of comprehensive lobbying regulations ever adopted by this commission or its predecessors. After a year of experience with the regulations, uh, staff took the opportunity to address some technical cleanup issues, uh, tweak regulated filing practices, and address some substance of policy questions. Uh, we posted the, revised, the proposed revisions on the JCOPE website as an informal proposal and solicited comments from the regulated community. Uh, we did receive some very helpful input from lobbying firms, trade associations, and good government groups. Based on these comments, uh, we have made a number of changes from the draft that you reviewed at the April meeting. Our goal today is to have the commission vote to start a rulemaking under the State Administrative Procedure Act and have the revisions in place for the lobbying registration period that begins on January 1st, 2021. Should the commission elect to move forward, the proposal will be posted in the state, excuse me, published in the state register, followed by a 60 day notice and comment period. Any substantive revisions that result from that proposal would require, require an additional 45 day notice and comment period before any enactment can occur. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carol Quinn, uh, Deputy Director of Lobbying Guidance, and she's gonna go over the, uh, the specific proposed changes. I also want to say that we really appreciate the comments that came in from the regulated community, and uh, we hope to continue the dialogue with those who've shown interest. So, Carol? Okay, I'm making sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go through the some of the comments kind of by category, focusing on the definition of designated lobbyists and some issues related to lobby days and also the coalition provisions. I'll get into specific changes we're proposing to the draft revisions presented at the last meeting. Um, these changes, these changes um, are highlighted in yellow to try to give you some indication of what we changed from last commission meeting to this. Um, so, anyway, I will, after each topic, I will stop and ask if the commissioners have any questions. So moving to the first topic, designated lobbyists. That is on page five, 943.3G. The concerns that we, we, we received about five comments on 940. In those comments, some concerns were raised about volunteers, board members, and ad hoc committee or task force members being considered lobbyists. So first I'm gonna point out that the new language in the definition was included to clarify that a person can be their own designated lobbyist. Based on the discussion at last meeting, we put back in the on behalf of a client language in this draft that you have in front of you. This draft now is very close to how the definition reads with respect to board members and the existing regulations. 
and I'll point out, we actually never intended to change the position on board members. Like I said, we only wanted to clarify with these revisions in general that a person can be their own designated lobbyist. So let me get through a couple more things that relate to designated lobbyists and then I'll take some questions. We also have on page 20, we, the regulations also make clear that mere attendance at a lobby day does not make any person a lobbyist because that does not constitute direct contact unless they speak to a public official on behalf of an organization or on behalf of their employer. So to recap that, at lobby days, only those employees or board members, officers, or directors who attend and speak a lobbying message to a public official at a lobby day get disclosed on lobbying filing. It's not enough just to be in the room or at the rally during a lobby day. In order to address concerns about volunteers and members of organizations possibly being considered individual lobbyists, we clarified on page 23 um, this is in section 943.6, C is in CAT 5. We've, we clarified that volunteers, and we added the word mere, the volunteers or mere members of an organization would not be listed as an individual lobbyist of a lobbying organization on the organization's filing. They're not listed based on activity on a lobby day or really any other day. So the regs try, you know, we're seeking to make clear that volunteers or mere members of an organization do not meet the definition of an individual lobbyist. They would not be a designated lobbyist. So this relates back to the definition, of course, of individual lobbyist, which is a person who is employed, retained, or designated. We add the word here again, just to clarify that regular members of an organization would not be considered an individual lobbyist. So, the bottom line, by making the revisions to the definition of designated lobbyists, again, we were seeking to clarify that individual people, individual persons, can be their own designated lobbyists. And if so, if, and should report lobbying activity if, if they meet the $5,000 threshold. We also make clear, again, that volunteers or mere members of an organization aren't individual lobbyists, and board members and employees who attend a lobby day are also not individual lobbyists unless they speak to the public official at the lobby day. All right, that's it in a nutshell on designated lobbyists. So I'm ready to take any questions that any commissioners have. Any questions? It looks like Commissioner DePiro has yes. hands up. So a scenario that will, this would impact, and I'm not quite sure on the um, variables, for a Chamber of Commerce or Trade Association that does not have a PAC or a registered lobbyist, but they take members to Albany and they do lobby with specific um, public officials um, and the executive director or CEO um, and committee members who are not registered lobbyists can speak on behalf of the organization. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? You're, you're talking about board members, directors, or officers? No, if you're, if you're a Chamber of Commerce or Trade Association and you do not have a PAC, a Political Action Committee, nor do you have a registered lobbyist on staff or as a consultant, and you, you as the executive, the paid chief, chief staff member, take members or committee members to Albany and speak to a public official, have meetings in their office, is that still okay? You can take members to, if this is a lobby day, or you can take members to an office. If the organization is registered as a lobbyist, then any individual person, which would be an employee, or again, a board member, director, or officer who speaks a lobbying message, who lobbies basically, um, would be considered a lobbyist. But what if they don't have a registered lobbyist in the organization? In other so words, they haven't hit the, the issue would be whether or not your organization spends more than $5,000 engaging in lobbying activity. Um, based on your scenario, it's not clear that it would meet the $5,000 threshold. But that, um, the question that uh, Deputy Director Quinn is, is trying to ask is, is the organization registering to lobby on its own behalf. And I think Commissioner DePiro, you're, you're trying to clarify when you would have to. 
Right. Um, and if you have a type of meeting, would you have to register on your own behalf? And it would, I think, depend on if you're spending more than $5,000 on the lobbying activity. And the exactly. travel expense is not part of that analysis, correct, Carol? Correct. Correct. So it really would depend on if you've already registered or if you've hit the $5,000 threshold. Commissioner Fisher has a question. Um, I have a question. Um, if I understood what Ms. Quinn said about designated lobbyists, and I took notes as, as you were speaking, Carol, um, okay. employed, retained, or designated were the three verbs, I guess. Um, the definition, though, uses different words. So selected, appointed, named, or otherwise intended. So I think I understand what selected, appointed, or named means, but I'm not sure what otherwise intended means, and it seems to broaden things out and make it sort of a guessing game as to somebody's intention. Whereas, you know, a selected, a, a, the act of selecting, appointing, or naming is going to be perhaps captured in minutes or a board action, um, by resolution, I don't, I guess it, um, I like narrowing the definition down, but it seems that being otherwise intended broadens it right back out again. And I'm saying that as a lay person, not as a Right, so when I refer to uh, employed, designated, or retained, that's the definition of individual lobbyist. And just taking a step back, when an entity registers as a lobbyist, the entity itself has anticipated spending, incurring or expending compensation expenses more than $5,000 in a year. And so then they register as the entity. And then on that registration, they list individual lobbyists who are people who actually do the lobbying for the entity. So then the definition of designated lobbyist comes into play because th that entity will list any employees that, that lobby for them. If they have an outside lobbyist, they'll list them. Um, so it, and then the designated lobbyist could be a board member, officer, or director. So they get listed as an individual lobbyist on a registration. The individual lobbyist, the individual person does not actually register themselves. They're just listed on a filing. So then, but getting back really to your point, I think, which is more what does otherwise intended to lobby, and I think it, it is more of a catch-all. So it is, we're trying to capture people who lobby on behalf of a client who do not meet their definition of employee or retained. And using the word selected, appointed, named, or otherwise intended to lobby is just a way of capturing persons or board members, officers, or directors who are lobbying either for themselves or for the entity that they're a board member, director, or officer of. Does that answer your question? I guess it does, but I feel I'm a little uneasy about what the word intended does to the definition. Uh, Judge Yates would like to comment, uh, so why don't we let him jump in? First of all, um, thank you for making the change. Uh, it is better than the language I was complaining about last time, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I still, though, in other places, and I can't put my finger on it, uh, the old regulations use the word at the behest of, and in terms of Commissioner Fisher's concern, wouldn't it be better to, instead of saying otherwise intended to say at the behest of, you've already got that language in the existing rules and people know what that means. Well, the I think the words on behalf of is what is, is in, I guess, on behalf of is similar. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I thank you for putting, putting back in on behalf. That was my concern last time. I'm just addressing Commissioner Fisher's remarks now. Yeah, and I believe, Commissioner, that is in the definition of beneficial client. Yeah. And that's where you're getting, you're remembering that. It says on whose behalf and at whose request or behalf. Yeah, so it it's an existing term of art that people understand, and I think it would more directly deal with what you're trying to get at and Commissioner Fisher's concern. But I think the issue would be you, you wouldn't have on behalf of and on behalf of. For beneficial client, we use on behalf uh, the behest language and not behalf, right? So it would just you wouldn't use both in the same definition. Well, I'm just saying then. Then what does otherwise intended accomplish? The uh, I will. There, there's no there's no hidden meaning there when we added designated lobbyists to the regulations, it, uh, even initially in, in, in 2018, uh, it was because that term had never been defined by this commission or any of its predecessor agencies. It had simply been a term in the statute and, and basically unaddressed from there. So we did the best we could using a plain meaning definition to say what is to designate? And it is to select, to appoint, or it's otherwise conveyed an intent for this person to do something. They've been designated. And so if the commission is concerned that that somehow conveys um, a, quote, designation on someone that wasn't intended, you can see where I'm going with this, then we can narrow it. But at the same time, we didn't want to be restrictive such that, you know, there's a very specific path of events that have to occur for someone to be identified as a lobbyist. And if you don't follow those specific paths, then it's a way around it. So that was simply the, the use of the term or otherwise intended. And it was meant that there could be another way to convey to someone that they are designated as a lobbyist. And like I said, if the commission is con concerned that it is too broad and carries too much weight, then we can consider changes. We can leave it to see what the comments come in on it. We're, we're open to ideas, but um, that, that is where it came from. There, there's nothing more than just an attempt to give meaning to an otherwise undefined term. So uh, what if we replace intended with designated? That would be circular, though. No, because You've named three specific ways of designating, and then you're saying otherwise designated. So it isn't circular because it, it says here's one, here's two, here's three, and we haven't thought of four, five, or six, but there might be other ways to so designate. What, what about the word chosen or otherwise chosen to lobby? Yep. That works for me. I'm okay with that. When, uh, when we go forward, if, if, if that's what the commission wants, then it should be included in the motion uh, to, to vote on. I, I, it's, it's really up to the commission, and since nothing's on the table yet, um, we'll just kind of keep it uh, tucked away until that time. And, just, and please keep in mind, the idea here is that this will, you know, we're hoping that today you'll approve beginning the rulemaking. So it will go out for public comment. And we expect entities to continue to comment on this definition so that we can make it as clear as possible. Are there any more questions? Carol, why don't you move on to the next topic, if, unless anybody else has anything. Martin, does this take us to, to Exhibit C or Attachment C? 
No, not yet, sir. This is uh, okay. Carol still going through her Got it. Uh, her summary. So, Carol, why don't you move on to the next topic? Thank you. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to coalition. We did receive some comments on the coalition provisions. Concerns were raised about the following: uh, the impact on "quote unquote" paper coalitions, how a coalition, you know, concerns about how a coalition can track each member's contribution of money or resources. Can Jacob actually require coalitions to disclose its lobbying activity? And just an overall general concern that the lobbying regulations will discourage the formation of coalitions. So, first, I want to point out that it seems like there might be a fundamental misunderstanding of the coalition provision. The regulations do not do not require coalitions to file as a coalition. They simply require that a coalition that coalition activity be disclosed somewhere. Again, our regulations and the whole goal with our regulations is transparency. So we're trying to get the coalition activity, which does occur, to, to be disclosed somewhere so the public knows who's behind uh, lobbying activity. So this disclosure could be either done by the coalition itself, if they actually choose to file as a coalition, or by the members uh, of the coalition who hit that $5,000 threshold and thereby must report their own lobbying activity. So we've made um, a change to address that misunderstanding. At page 53, at section 943.9 H, Romanet I, we added in a language, hopefully to clarify that this is an optional filing mechanism for groups that qualify as a coalition. So if the coalition chooses not to, to, to use it, they choose not to file as a coalition, that's fine. The only caveat is that the members of the coalition must disclose their coalition activities on their own filing as applicable. I can get into that more in a minute. So um, another concern raised by commoners were just the burdens being placed on coalitions. And again, I'm just gonna point out that coalitions do not have to file as a coalition, the regs don't require that. So they don't actually have to track their members' contributions, whether it be money or resources. Instead, the member can disclose that lobbying activity on their own filing if the coalition opts not to file as a coalition. The paper coalitions may not even hit the threshold, the $5,000 threshold um, as a coalition triggering reporting. But if they do, then the coalition again can choose whether it wants to file and disclose that activity as a coalition or whether it, it does not want to. Um, so for any members of a non-filing coalition, whether it's paper coalition or a regular coalition, any members that actually spend over the 5,000 in comp and expenses must disclose all their lobbying activity anyway, regardless of how much or how little each activity being reported costs. So this would include, we're just clarifying, this would include activities related to coalitions. Another um, change in the draft was on page 53, again, uh, in Romanet 2. We made the definition, we were hoping to make the definition of coalition a little cleaner. So we changed some language in there, you can see with the highlights. Um, Coalitions are a group of otherwise unaffiliated entities that come together, pooling funds or resources to lobby on a common interest. They're not incorporated and they haven't otherwise created a limited liability entity. So we're trying to clarify that definition. Um, so, you know, consistent with our overarching goals that I've mentioned of transparency, the whole idea behind the coalition provisions really was to tr tr promote transparency. The public should know who's behind the billboard that says paid for by X code. Um, so again, giving an option, we're not telling coalitions they have to file because that can be cumbersome. They might have a lot of members. It's difficult for them to track, or they just don't have a responsible party that, that wants to step up and, and do the filings for the coalition. Um, so, you know, we, were, we, we could have had coalitions have to file, but we really were sensitive to the fact and we did not want to discourage uh, the formation of coalitions. So that's why we provided this optional reporting mechanism for coalitions. Um, 
and, and that's really what the provisions provide. Um, and I guess that's where I'll stop to see if you guys have any questions on um, coalitions in general. Uh, looks like Judge Yates has his hand up. Just so I'm clear then, if somebody, an individual or a small group, um, does not spend $5,000, um, and but they sign on to a group letter, um, and the, the group itself in toto spends more than 5000 and a majority of the members in that group say, yeah, file as a coalition. But the individual who signed on to the letter, or maybe helped draft the letter, um, doesn't agree. What's the status? Does that person get listed in the coalition filing as a lobbyist? And would that, in, would that include a 501 C3? So are you asking, Commissioner, if Two questions, the yeah. coalition decides to file or not, whether the members have to agree? Yeah, to 100, to people, 100 people in organizations sign a group letter, and 52 out of those 100 say, yeah, file as a coalition. And the other 48 say, no, don't. I'm just a, I'm just a poor person who signed on, you know, and, uh, and I don't spend any money. I just agree with your letter or your activity. Well, I would say I don't know if the regulations get involved with whether a coalition decides to file or not. I would think that within the coalition. Uh, I would also point the other thing that might get to your point is so if a coalition does file as a coalition, they will list uh, only those members that meet the threshold as beneficial clients. So if that member that doesn't want to be or that doesn't want the coalition to file or for whatever reason doesn't want um, to be listed on a filing as a beneficial client. Remember, they're only listed as a beneficial client anyway if they either give the coalition more than $5,000, because obviously that would trigger it as uh, listed as a beneficial client of a filing coalition, or if whatever they give to the coalition plus whatever they do on the side adds up to more than $5,000. That's what triggers a member being listed as a beneficial client on a coalition filing, again, when that coalition opts to file as a coalition. Okay, so I had a two-part question and I, I think I'm clear on one of the two now. So first of all, individually, each person listed in the coalition would himself or herself or by the groups or in the group have spent $5,000. Um, otherwise, they're not going to be listed as a coalition member. Yeah, that's not correct. Not a beneficial client, correct. Okay. And then the other, the other part of the question that's still fuzzy for me is when you have a disagreement about how to file, um, there's really no guidance about how the coalition, how the option is determined. You're correct, well, sir. There is no provision in the regs that address how that determination is made. We didn't want to dictate to a, a group of entities how they should be governing their own decisions. So if, uh, if you and the commission uh, think that that should be addressed, we'll be happy to come up with some language maybe for the next round of revisions. But there is nothing in there now that, that addresses that one way or the other. Yeah, yeah I'd really like to hear comments from the uh, affected community on that because there are so many times that there are group letters with a hundred signatures uh, and it just seems unwieldy. I, I, I don't know how it would resolve, but I, instead of suggesting something, I'd rather, I'd rather like, I'd rather highlight it and hear from the community. That, that works for us too. We will, we will make sure to put that in the, in the group of points where we're really looking for input. Yeah. Commissioner Deering is uh, looking to speak. Oh, great, thanks. Uh, Carol, so if you have a scenario where 10 people got together and each uh, contributed $4,999 to a coalition, and the coalition spends that on lobbying activity, could you have a scenario then where the coalition doesn't file a report and then none of the individuals are required to file a report? Yes. Well. So to answer that question, first of all, the first trigger is, does the coalition spend more than $5,000 on lobbying? 
And if so, then they have to decide whether they want to file or not. Um, they would not have to file as a coalition or no one has to file uh, a lobbying report unless they spend 5,000. So that would be the first thing I would say to that. So I'm assuming if each member is giving almost $5,000 to the coalition that the coalition is probably hitting that threshold and spending more than five. Uh, so I would assume that the coalition could file as a coalition. And, and uh, if they didn't, then um, the, and if they did, if the members are giving just under five, or even if they give five um, thousand as a contribution, they would not be listed as a beneficial client on the coalition filing unless they also spend money on their own. So that's why that questionnaire comes into play. So a coalition could send out that questionnaire that asks each member what their other lobbying activity is. So for example, if you give under the threshold to the coalition, but you're also spending, I mean, you might be a registered lobbyist or a client already, obviously you're already spending five if that's the case, or you might have spent, I don't know, maybe 2000 or something like that on your own, doing your own lobbying as an entity. That would get combined and could put you over the threshold and get you listed as a beneficial client on that coalition filing. I'm gonna jump in here, Carol. Um, Commissioner Deering, we addressed, we, excuse me, we considered this question um, during the initial promulgation of the regulations. And I remember having a, having a dialogue with uh, Commissioner Jacob about this because originally it had uh, the draft, you know, back in 2016 or whenever it was originally drafted said, any members who provide funds or, or services are, are considered beneficial clients of the coalition. And during the, the, the regu regulatory process, we came to the, the agreement that if a group wasn't gonna otherwise have to file, this shouldn't draw them in. So if you do spend less than $5,000 truly in total on everything you do, coalition or otherwise, then the regulations do not bring you, up, now bring you in if the coalition files. It's a, it's a legitimate policy discussion either way, but that's why we came to that, yeah. that answer. And you're right, you do present a scenario that could occur, yeah. but in the interest of uh, ensuring disclosure without overreaching beyond what the law requires initially without a coalition, even as an individual, uh, that's where we ended up. Okay. And then just so, and I'm just trying to grab an understanding. So, say for argument's sake, a, a coalition spends fifty thousand dollars. All of the contributions from individuals are below five thousand dollars. Is there anything that would have to be filed by the coalition? Potentially, potentially no. Okay. Um, so, as, as Carol points out, you're in this scenario. You've got a coalition that is made up of these groups that each contribute under the threshold, but in total you have a large amount of spending. Right. The coalition uh, filing option is precisely that. It's an option. And so if the election is to not do that and everyone's under the threshold, that is where you will end up. Okay. Um, but again, the idea was that if you were not otherwise uh, required to file as an individual, we weren't going to force the coalition into action. Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, bring to the commission's attention and the regulated community is as you can see, we've had a very complicated discussion now over some small changes. We had a very complicated discussion when drafting these. And as we go along, our goal has always been to simplify and clarify and provide an, an optional mechanism. But if it's the opinion of the commission, it's the opinion of the regulated community that this doesn't work or that it's too complicated or it doesn't lead to transparency or it discourages formation of coalitions, this is, we want better regulation, uh, whatever it takes. So, um, you know, we considered proposing a version without any coalition provisions whatsoever, but we thought what was in there could be improved. So we proposed these revisions, but, you know, sort of everything's on the table. Carol, do you want to go on to the last set of changes? That was really it. The rest of the changes are more of a technical nature. Um, we okay, did thanks. reach out 
some of the uh, commenters uh, to discuss their comments on the phone. And we, to the extent we could, we addressed some of their concerns in the draft in front of you. Um, but I, that was all I was planning on presenting uh, to the commission unless we have questions on other topics and I'd be happy to answer those. Um, I don't see any more hands, so, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Fisher. I just wanna ask a general question. So sure. there was a comment in one of the letters, the one from uh, Zimmerman, I guess. Yes. Um, in my opinion, draft regulations impose financial hurdles, yada, yada. Strongly encourage the commission to carefully evaluate the relative cost of compliance. Um, so, and it goes to what you were saying too. We, if we want more transparency, we need to make it easier, not harder. Correct. We need to make it less expensive, not more expensive. So, does staff feel like we're at least neutral in terms of cost of complying? Or have we actually made it a little easier? Or have we maybe made it more expensive and more difficult? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say either way. What I will say is you had a statute that was originally drafted in 1977 and amended three or four times over the last 40 years. And, and never at any point had a body said, let's answer all the questions. And so, when you set about doing that and you take 40 years of advisory opinions that were on the books and, and did govern the filing practices under the Lobbying Act, you know, putting them in one place and then answering all the open questions that we, you know, felt we could answer at the time, certainly it's going to increase complexity. I, I'm not gonna say it doesn't, simply because we answered questions that hadn't been answered before. Like every rulemaking, there is the balance and of, of whether there is a cost benefit analysis, or uh, whether it is a cost or a benefit to impose the regulations. We felt initially and we continue to feel that we're doing the best we can to balance those two things, the cost of compliance with the benefit of additional transparency and the benefit of questions answered where they weren't otherwise. Um, but, Today, which you know, we're looking to start a, a SAPA rulemaking, and at any point in the future, we view this as a as a fluid, dynamic body of, of rules that will, you know, not to be too esoteric, but will evolve, and and they will ebb from the complex to the simple, the simplified, to attempt to keep that balance in place. And so, um, are they more complicated than they were before the regs? Yes, but I think it's balanced out by the benefit to the public and the answers to the unanswered questions. So, and then the other potential benefit for us to consider is staff um, reduction in complexity. Or we if it's easier for the staff to do its job because we've clarified things, then that could reduce our cost. I would hope so. <laughs> um, what I will say is, when we drafted these, we were in the process of writing a whole new electronic filing system. And so we were able to take the changes that were proposed in the original regulations and incorporate those into the filing system such that there are now features available that weren't before and there are now ways to file certain things electronically where there weren't before, um, which reduces the staff burden. But like anything, there's going to be a, a curve where you know everybody has to get up to speed, which we've done over the last year before it becomes less work. Thank you. Sort of your inverse J curve. Uh, may, may I ask? Uh, please. May I ask something? This is Commissioner Jacob. Sir. Under what circumstances would a coalition be required to file? And under what circumstances would it be optional? So it's never required. Never required. Correct. If they meet the definition even, of a coalition. Even, right, but even it, it, is that so? Even if if the coalition were a separate entity, legal entity, and it spent more than five thousand dollars as a coalition, 
would it be required to file? Yes, sir, that is one of the changes we put in place was that when, and in this draft that you have before you, when an entity does form, whether it's a legal corporation or a limited liability entity, that takes it out of the coalition world and it is now its own entity that has standard filing requirements like any other organization. So it no longer has that option because it is required to file on its own if it meets the threshold. I, I suppose that takes me back to that old question I asked that a coalition can conceivably consist of many people who donate, as Commissioner Deering said, right up to the limit of $5,000. And then the coalition lobbies and is not required to file, but it's, and, and it seems, yeah, I, so we haven't addressed that actually, except to say that it's optional. They can, if they wish, if they do not incorporate or do not become a legal entity. Yeah, yeah. As you as you recall, Commissioner, you and I had a, a fairly spirited discussion about this the first time around, and I do. And my position had been a little more expansive, and uh, as you and I discussed, this was a potential outcome, but we agreed that in the interest of not imposing a burden where there wouldn't be one absent the regulations that this was the balance to strike. But you, you are right that this still exists. Um, but, you know, as, as in every policy decision, there are uh, causes and effects. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any more hands. So staff uh, would request a motion to begin a staff of rulemaking, if that is the commission's decision. And I will also remind uh, the commission that Commissioner Fisher had uh, proposed a change to the language in designated lobbyists, uh, which would could potentially be incorporated into any motion. So, uh, can I can I have a motion, please? Commissioner. I speak Commissioner McCarthy. Commissioner McCarthy. Commissioner McCarthy. Thank you. Second, Commissioner DePiro. All in, all in favor, Martin, we need a roll, please. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce a motion to amend the definition of uh, designated lobbyist uh, to replace the word intended with the word chosen. Commissioner McCarthy, would you accept that as a friendly amendment? Yes, I would accept it. Thank you. Uh, and Commissioner DePiro second as amended. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'll call the roll on the on the motion to uh, commence a staff of rulemaking with the regs as proposed to you with the amendment Commissioner Fisher identified. Uh, Commissioner Deering. Uh, yes. Commissioner DePiro. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Fisher. Yeah. Commissioner Horowitz. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Jacob. Yes. yes. Commissioner Levine. Yes. Judge McCarthy. Yes. Commissioner Weissman. Yes. Judge Yates. Yes. Chair Rosen. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, let's move on. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. We fully uh, apologize. The source of funding regulations you've seen before, there are no changes since the last meeting, but uh, there are changes from the original rulemaking. So uh, we do need a motion to send those out for staff as well. Uh, so we would, we would need that as well. I apologize for not bringing that up earlier. No worries. Can I have a motion, please? I'll move. Commissioner Deering. Thank you. Second. Commissioner Weissman. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, uh, on the source of funding regulations, Commissioner Deering. 
Yes. Commissioner DePiro. Yes. Commissioner Fisher. Yes. Commissioner Horowitz. Yes. Commissioner Jacob. Yes. Commissioner Levine. Yes. Judge McCarthy. You have the judge. I can't see him. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Weissman. Yes. Judge Yates. Yes. And Chair Rosen. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the last thing I'll move very quickly is uh, if there are the regulated community about the use of stock or equity as lobbying compensation, staff is interested in hearing input on that issue. Um, and they can reach out to any of us offline. Thank you. Thank you. All right, does this take us to, to item five on our agenda? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay. So the committee convened earlier this month, the confidentiality committee convened earlier this month to consider the staff's extensive analysis of the legal issues relating to the commission's ability to release more information about its operations and investigations. The committee needs to continue its comprehensive review of the materials prepared by staff. The committee plans to reconvene in July and hopes to be able to present to the full commission at the next meeting, a detailed plan, including specific proposals to amend the commission's record access regulations, meeting guidelines and internal practices. So it can, among other things, provide more information to the public and improve communication with complainants, witnesses and subjects of investigations. At this time, we are concluded with the public session of the June JCO meeting. Can I have a motion, please? Uh, Mr. To Chairman, may I interrupt? Sure, Gary, go ahead. I have a question for staff. Could you indicate to us, without going into any particularities, which would be confidential, the number of sworn complaints that have been received and upon which no action has been taken by the commission? Commissioner Levine, are you talking about over the history of the commission or within a period of time? Since the decisions in Trump and Cox. I, I don't have a number for you at this moment in time. Um, we can report back at a future meeting. Are, are there any? We've changed the definition of sworn complaint and what we determined to include in that after the Cox litigation. And so there, again, I would have to look back in time um, to see if before the Cox decision and before we made that change, if there were some that we did not take action on based on the current definition. And well, in the following, Mr. Chairman, may, if I may, uh, may, may we assume that there are at least several sworn complaints about which the commission has taken no action? Commissioner, I would not, I would not say that that's an accurate characterization. Again, um, the, for many years, this commission deemed a sworn complaint to be based on firsthand knowledge. So any complaints that alleged violations of public office law that were based on firsthand knowledge were acted on by the commission. We, we after the more recent litigation and decisions, we dropped the requirement that it be based on firsthand knowledge and the commission has been acting on all notarized complaints that allege violations of the public officer's law. So I think it would be inaccurate to say there are several, but again, I would need to go back and we would have to look at that. Yes, well, uh, again, on the follow on, Mr. Chairman, on the premise that there are one or more extant in which the complainant made a sworn statement to the commission, is it the position of staff and us as the commission to comply with the protocol enunciated in Trump and Cox?
I'm sorry, I, I did not understand that question if it was directed to me. Well, let, let me let me reiterate this, if I may. On the premise that there is at least one extant complaint that was sworn by the complaint that has been presented to the commission in addressing that sworn complaint, the staff in the commission comply with the protocols enunciated in Trump and CAC. I'm not sure what protocol specifically you are referring to. As I mentioned, we have revisited how we interpret sworn complaints, and we have been complying with the statute with respect to how we handle sworn complaints. I don't believe either of the litigation cases that you talked about set up any other or any protocol for the commission to follow other than with respect to the specific facts of those cases where we were ordered to take specific action, which the commission complied with in each instance. Well, then if you wouldn't mind taking 30 seconds to synopsize what the requirement was in Trump and then what the requirement was in Cox in responding to the complaint. I don't have the specific orders and decisions in front of me, but in each instance, the commission was ordered something along the lines of to, if it had not already done so, to take a vote on the specific complaint and to notify the court that the commission had done so. Well, let's, let's parse through this and take the aspect with regard to taking the vote. Is it the position of staff that if a sworn complaint is pending, that the commission is not under the rubric of either Cox or Trump, which is to say that the commission has to take a vote within a specified period of time. Again, both of those decisions were at different points of time for the commission. So I'm, I, I'm not really following what your line of questioning is, but the commission follows the statute. And if it receives a sworn complaint alleging violations of the public officer's law, it votes on whether or not to commence an investigation within 60 days of receipt of that complaint. So again, on the follow on, Mr. Chairman, if a complaint has been, a sworn complaint has been filed with the commission and no action has been taken within 60 days, is it the interpretation of staff that the complainant is not entitled to be informed of that fact? If, I'm sorry, if the commission receives a, what it considers to be a sworn complaint alleging a violation of the public officer's law and the commission votes not to commence, you're asking under the statute, is the, the commission required to notify the complainant of what the commission did? Yes, that's my first the question. Answer is, the answer is that under the statute, the commission is not required to notify the complainant of how it voted or that it voted under the language of the statute. Well, now may I ask you to address the alternative? I didn't mean to interrupt you, go ahead. I was going to say that, you know, the commission can, in certain circumstances, authorize communication under the statute. But as you know, and as the chair mentioned a few moments ago, there's a committee of commissioners that are evaluating all of these issues, looking at the law, and is going to make recommendations relating to the records access regulations and internal policies about communications with complainants, witnesses, subjects, 
and determine if it wants to disclose more information that that is then is required under the statute but within the ambit of the maintaining the confidentiality of its investigation so this is both yeah. a, a current topic pending before the committee that's handling records access issues well i appreciate uh, everyone's indulgence let me ask on a follow-up further are there any complaints sworn or otherwise that, they, that are before the commission in which no action has been taken by the commission within 60 days. I'm sorry, yes. Commissioner, unless you change how you phrase the question in a subtlety I missed, I thought, you know, I said we'd have to get back to you on that because again, we've sort of changed our procedures in light of litigation and I would have to go back through the commission's record. All right. Uh, please do that. Uh, let me ask the question on the hypothetical circumstance that there was a sworn complaint presented to the commission. The commission did not take action of any sort within 60 days. Mm -hmm. What is the obligation of the commission at that juncture per Cox and Trump holding? I'm sorry, the, if the commission did not take any action within 60 days? Yes. I don't think that the Cox or Trump litigation is the issue here. It's what the statute says. And again, it's how the commission has interpreted sworn complaints, but it takes, it, it's required to vote within 60 days if it receives a sworn complaint alleging violations of the public office law against people over whom it has jurisdiction. Right, but in the circumstance in which the commission does not take a vote within 60 days on a complaint filed subsequent to Trump and Cox, is it the staff's position that Trump and Cox apply or do not apply? Commissioner, I'm, I'm really, I'm not going to opine on what those cases dictate the future set of hypothetical facts and I'm telling you don't happen because we uh, read the statute and comply with the statute. So to the extent that that, that happens, we will deal with it as a commission. The commission will decide how to proceed and there, will be, um, there may be questions and, and, and legal advice that I would have to give under those circumstances. Yeah, uh, I understand. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, uh, I strongly urge that a report be made by staff specifically indicating all sworn complaints that have been presented since the holding in Cox, in which the circumstances presented in which no action has been taken within 60 days, and also indicate an indication from staff to us as to why Trump and Cox do not apply in those circumstances in those cases. Thank you. Gary. Um, I need a motion to enter into executive session, please. Mr. Deering. Thank you. Second. Mr. Fisher. Thank you. Martin, please call the roll. The motion to executive session, Commissioner Deering. Yes. Commissioner DePiro. Yes. Commissioner Fisher. Yes. I got it. Commissioner Horowitz, please. Yes. Commissioner Jacob. Yes. Commissioner Levine. Yes. Judge McCarthy. Yes. Commissioner Weitzman. Yes. Judge Yates. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Cohen. Yes. And Chair Rosen. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Public session is adjourned. We're back in public session. Uh, Monica, can you please report on executive session? Sure. Um, we discuss litigation matters. We consider a request for an advisory opinion on an ethics matter. We granted an extension of an exemption from post-employment restrictions person to uh, public office law 73-8-B. We commenced one substantial basis investigation 
and we authorized steps in several investigative matters, closed the matter, and discussed several other investigative matters. Great, thank you. Is there a motion to close the meeting? Commissioner Weissman. Is there a second? Yes. Yates. Commissioner Yates. Yates. Thank you. On the, on the motion, Commissioner Cohen. Yes. Commissioner Deering. Yes. Commissioner Shapiro. Yes. Commissioner Fisher. Yes. Commissioner Horowitz. Yes. Mr. Jacob. Yes. Mr. Levine. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Weissman. Yes. Judge Yates. Yes. That's it. Carried. Motion carries. Great. Okay. Thank you. Take care.